Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar discussion panel this morning. Our aim is to discuss extending our reach and critical actions to end malaria. This is a, a panel jointly sponsored by Commonics International and Malaria Consortium. My name is Judy Heichelheim. I'm a senior vice president at Chemonics. I am in the uh, health and supply chain division of Chemonics, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. So just before we get started, I wanted to go through just a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with working through Zoom and webinars, this, this will have live interpretation today in both French and Portuguese. And to access this feature, you need to look at the ribbon at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a globe icon labeled interpretation. So if you click on it and choose your preferred language option, you will be able to, to use these, um, this interpretation. And we're going to put that instruction in the chat as well. If you have any problems, go ahead and, and chat it and someone will answer your question. Um, we are using both the chat and the question and answer feature today. So if you have technical problems, use the chat. But when we're asking you for questions to submit to our panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A feature. Um, we will have points, three points in time during the discussion today for questions and answers. So, so think about what you would like to ask. Um, we also recommend that you use what's called the speaker view in Zoom. Uh, it's a, if you go up to the top of your screen, uh, there is a icon that says view. And if you click that, you can select speaker view. And that way you will see just the speakers rather than um, all of the icons for, for participants. So I also wanted to say that while we can't be here together in person, uh, it's exciting to do this through Zoom. And it allows us to have broad <laughs> engagement. And I'm going to ask that um, all of the panelists please mute your microphone if, if you're not talking. Um, we want this to be as intimate as possible, as fluid as possible, and to have a good dialogue. So we are keeping things on a first name basis. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna get us started into the discussion. Uh, and just to note, we are waiting on one last panelist to join, but hopefully she will be able to join soon. Um, so just to set the stage, the global malaria community recognizes that there's a gap between the ambitious eradication goals and the realities of increasing incidents and the need also to reset after the COVID pandemic. Um, more than 600,000 people still die from malaria every year. Health systems are not yet delivering the prevention, diagnostics, care, and treatment services needed to reach all communities affected by the disease. Funding, infrastructure, human resource gaps, conflict, social stigma, and geographical logistics all place barriers in the way of 100% coverage. In sub-Saharan African countries, one in eight people are more than one hour from their local health center, and one in six are more than two hours from a hospital. For those living in rural areas, distances are often even greater, and they face additional barriers to accessing the care they need, like the cost to travel there and the cost of the treatment itself. To end malaria, we must leave no one behind. But what does that look like in practice? What are the targeted approaches that can best optimize investments and meaningfully increase the reach of locally driven solutions in the fight against malaria? So we have an esteemed panel here today with many years of experience spanning the globe to help us explore these important questions today. So I'm gonna briefly introduce who the panelists are, and then as we get into questions, and uh, I'm going to ask each of them to speak a little bit about who they are. Um, but our panelists include Lisa Hare, who is the chief of the malaria supply chain branch for the US President's Malaria Initiative. We have Dr. Karine Karema, who is the interim chief executive officer for Rollback Malaria, RBM, Partnership to End Malaria. We have Dr. James, to Ben Durana, Chief Executive of the Malaria Consortium. We have Dr. Baltazar Candrino, Director, Mozambique National Malaria Control Program. Uh, we have Dr. 
Mulamuli Mpofu, Senior Director of the Global Malaria Programs for Chemonix International. And we have Charles Ojara and Jenneth Aber, both village health team workers in Uganda. So a wide span of panelists. Um, we are dropping into the, the chat a link to their bios if you want to find out more about who they are. And before we begin, I'm just going to give a little overview of the structure for our discussion today. We have three rounds of questions. The first round is going to focus on priority challenges that we have to address to extend our reach. The second round will include our panelists' insights on what's currently working well in the fight against malaria. And in the third round, we're going to discuss their ideas and thoughts on the most promising approaches for the way forward to end malaria. We'll take questions and answers from the audience after each round of questions. And then finally, at the end of the session, we're gonna ask each panelist to provide one final action or principle that we should all take away from this event. Um, I do know that there may be a lot of questions. And so if we're not able based on time to respond to all of the questions, We'll plan on continuing the discussion on social media, LinkedIn in the coming weeks. So please look out for that. And you see in the, it's on this side, in the top of my background, the hashtag actions to end malaria, that will be tagged for the discussion uh, following this session. Um, I also ask in your question and answer that you, if you have it specific to one of the panelists, please say that in your question. So, Without further ado, we're gonna shift into the first section of questions, which is around priority challenges. So for our panelists, before you answer, before I ask you the question, I'm gonna ask you to give a brief introduction of yourself, who you are and your role in the malaria response, and then I'll direct a question to you. So we're gonna start with our um, village health workers from Uganda. Charles and Janice. So Charles, can you introduce yourself, please? Just, you need to make sure you've unmuted yourself. I think you're still on mute, Charles. There we go, perfect, thank you. Yes, I'm Ojara Chans from Kitgum district uh, in Uganda. Uh, Kitgum Atide, sub-county, where is my location? It's, I'm the VST uh, team leader for Kitgum Atide sub-county. Mm -hmm. I'm here to present what can be done to minimize the malaria outbreak and if possible even to cure if we got any pattern that can support or we we love from the government. So thank you. Pertaining this question. Thank you, Charles. And, yes. and Jenneth, can you give a quick introduction of yourself as well? I'm Jenneth Babe, a VST from Kidgum District. As a parish supervisor, I always do assessment for the fever for the children under five. I always make a follow-up after treatment and make a referral if I see a danger sign. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Charles, I'm gonna ask you um, just to expand a little bit on your introduction, but from your perspective, who do you think are the unreached and what do you think are the biggest challenges in reaching them? Thank you, Judith. This is two technical questions in this one question. If you are carefully listening, uh, let me define the unreached population. Unreached population, those are the people who they stay far away from the facilities or from the VSTs in the community. If I can mention the example of this and rich people, uh, those are mobile people. If we need to take back to our location, those who when during cultivation, they plant their crop deep inland uh, to reach area. 
they plant their crops there where there's no people there. Many people, uh, they left them behind at home. Uh, and rich people also, those who are rearing cattle, those are unrich people. Uh, and rich people also, maybe even the soldiers during rebels activity or rebel war, they will be in the bush so we cannot chase them. So those are the unrich people. So uh, the, the challenges, challenges to, uh, to, to capture those unrich people, uh, we think it possible. We need to add the more obvious this, this need training. Because in the villages, you will find only two VSTs running 100 household plus. Yet in government setting, uh, one VST is supposed to oversee 25 household. So we request the training to reach and reach people. So when we are many, uh, other will follow the other people in the field there. That is the solution or the challenges that we cannot reach those people. Uh, we have, we have, I can say it, we have no transport, mean of transport for reaching them. Uh, we have also shortage of, of medicine or talk out. It's, drug get over and it lasts for so long. So we cannot, even if we are supposed to reach those people, we cannot reach them. And delay circle of delivery, delay circle of delivery of this little drug that we always receive quarterly. It's a delay and it proportional will not be equal. We'll find we have uh, many aridities less uh, anti-malarial. So this affect our work, this is the challenge. And in other communities that we always use work, we have low level of education. When we talk of low level of education, this, those people who are having low level of education need the fresher training to remind them. So, the fresher training is very key in medical, even not for us as a VST only, but even from our supervisors, staff, and the rest. Uh, we have also, we lack protective gear or protective wear that make our work difficult. Uh, when we talk of protective gear, all of everything that can protect us against infections. Even light during at night time, we don't have to tell. Yet in community, people come at night because malaria has no time to attack in the children. So that is briefly what I can mention and I can tell for the nation. So here, if they can consider this will be very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. I uh, really appreciate your, your thoughts and insights. We're gonna move to our next panelist. Uh, I welcome Dr. Kareen Karema from RBM. Uh, Kareen, can you give a brief introduction of yourself before I ask you your question? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Judy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and happy new year. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you for inviting me on behalf of the RBM partnership to end malaria to this important uh, webinar, since we are really discussing uh, what is needed for us to, to end uh, malaria and what are the critical actions that we, we should take. So I'm Corinne Karema. I'm from Rwanda. I've been working uh, in the malaria world for more than 20 years, and uh, since last year, uh, I've been the interim CEO. I'm serving as the interim CEO of the RBM partnership to end malaria. 
And uh, the, the, the partnership uh, to end malaria works basically to end malaria for good. So we are a, the, 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 the biggest platform for all partners. Uh, we are convening and coordinating partners that are involved and working for the malaria response. And this partnership includes uh, malaria affected countries, donors, uh, international uh, organization, multilateral, uh, as well as bilateral partners, academia, and uh, actually even uh, community health workers. So we are just a global platform that uh, has the aim to end malaria. Thank you so much, Corinne. Uh, so my question for you, you have a very different perspective on things than, than Charles and Janice do. Uh, from your global perspective, what do you think are the primary challenges in serving 100% of those at risk? Okay, so uh, first of all, I think uh, it's really important to, to understand that uh, uh, the malaria risk is heterogeneous. So uh, it's really variable uh, based on the needs of the population, as well as when, especially when you look at the, across the continuum of the malaria elimination. So it's really, first of all, important for us to, to understand and uh, define what, it's, what's, what's it, what is the meaning of the risk. Because, uh, as I say, the need of the population as well as the impact of the malaria intervention varies across the transmission setting. And that's why it's really important for us to, to have uh, data. So um, it's really, uh, as I say, it's very difficult. But what I will say, it will focus uh, mainly on the moderate and high transmission uh, setting. And then, of course, uh, as someone living in Africa, I will, uh, I will focus uh, in Africa. And then maybe I will just give an example of uh, the case management. So if, for instance, you look at the World Malaria Report, um, as you saw, 8% of the death uh, of children age uh, under five globally are due to malaria. And then 17% uh, uh, are in, uh, in uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. And 98% of malaria deaths are in Sub-Sahara Africa, and 80% 80 are children uh, and, uh, and the five. So, for instance, if I take that um, group of uh, our children who are actually the future of Africa, you will see that uh, only uh, one third of the children that have fever have access to malaria treatment. And then you will see that uh, mm -hmm. only 40% are properly diagnosed. And this is where you see that there is a risk. And those are uh, where I want to discuss what are the challenges, for instance, for, for us to reach all, all the children. So number one, it's, it's uh, of course, funding. Uh, this is one of the biggest funding for us to, to reach the population uh, that are in it, and in this case, children. The second one is, is data. We need to uh, reach the hardest reach population, the most affected uh, children, using data because we need to know where there is the highest malaria burden for us to reach. So number two is uh, we don't have uh, enough surveillance data mm -hmm. or quality data. And then the third one, of course, uh, we can uh, look at the primary health care. So it's very difficult uh, for us to, to have access always, uh, uh, as well as affordability of uh, all uh, the malaria control intervention. So globally, for me, it's more funding data, of course, all the implementation, the primary healthcare to have a strong health system in terms of supply chain, in terms of uh, uh, human uh, resources, as well as uh, uh, intervention, of course, to be able to cover all the, 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 the people in it. Those are, for me, the main challenges that I see uh, globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karine. Uh, we're going to move to our next panelist, um, Dr. Baltazar Candrino from our Mozambique NMCP. Um, Dr. Baltazar, can you please give a brief introduction of yourself, and then I'll ask you a question. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, my name is Baltazar Candrino. 
Um, I am a medical doctor by profession. I am actually the NMCP um, Mozambique director. And um, as the NMCP Mozambique director, I am manage the malaria program in, in this country at all levels, central, provincial, and district level. And I have also been working in the regional um, in this in the regional initiatives in Africa with uh, neighbor countries like South Africa and Eswatini. And also I've been working with the E8 uh, elimination aid initiative. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So Bathazar, uh, you have an amazing breadth of experience and you have a very, a very unique um, perspective compared to our other panelists. So from the government perspective, what do you see as the priorities for governments generally, but for your government um, and for development and technical partners in ensuring malaria interventions reach everyone, including those hardest to reach populations? Well, um, I would say that uh, from the government perspective, um, is uh, crucial to increase the investments in general to develop the the, the counter. Um, also, also it's crucial. It's important to to increase to have this social economical component, special to address the poverty and the knowledge about malaria. I would say um, knowledge about prevention, recognition, and the treatment. And um, important, a very important component is to improve the access to health care. Um, improved access to health care in two ways. One is to implementing the, the plan to build the different, the other health facilities because they already exist the plan. And the, the, the challenge is how can we implement that plan? And the second way is mm. go to the, this community um, initiative and also to um, community health workers or strengthen the community health uh, system. Um, from the development and technical partners, um, so they should focus on those areas where these people living and with already mapping and we know where they are. And also partners should uh, support the community interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to our next panelist, Dr. James Tabenderana from the Malaria Consortium. James, can you just give a, a brief introduction to yourself? Thanks, thanks, Judy, and greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm James Tabenderana, the Chief Executive of the Malaria Consortium, which is a UK-registered charity and a global technical leader in communicable diseases elimination. I am involved in the strategic and technical actions we take at the global and national levels to eliminate malaria and working collectively with our stakeholders. Thank you, James. Uh, so as you say, Malaria Consortium has been at the forefront of rolling out malaria interventions, especially to hard to reach populations. And some of those technical approaches include uh, integrated community case management, seasonal malaria chemo prevention, uh, I know there are others, but can you just tell us what are some of the most persistent problems you've faced in this work? Thanks, Judy. From my experience, some of the most persistent problems are suboptimal community acceptance and use of proven tools. The lack of information on how to reach populations to better engage them or better engage with them. And I think Dr. Candrino has already pointed this out as well as I think um, Dr. Kareen. The interrupted availability of malaria services, in particular, quality assured diagnosis, diagnosis. And I think, again, Charles has, has pointed it out, but in this case, it's the reverse, uh, i.e. not having antimalarials, um, but having diagnostics. And then the inadequate institutionalization of community-based services. For example, how community health workers fit within a primary health care system. And then I would say, lastly, difficulties integrating services within the health system, for example, intermittent prevention of malaria in mm. pregnancy and how that gets integrated through malaria, sorry, through antenatal care services. Thank you. Uh, that was a, a great summary. And just to shift now to Dr. Mula Mpupu. Mula, uh, can you give a brief introduction of yourself, please? 
Thanks so much, um, mm -hmm. Judy, and, and greetings to our participants. My name is uh, Mulan Pofu. I'm a senior director of global health programs at Chemonix. I support mainly uh, malaria projects, and mm -hmm. my work mainly involves supporting um, our different country projects, providing uh, technical support uh, in implementation of the activities that are prioritized in, in those countries, but also networking within the global community um, to understand the latest developments and make sure that those developments are integrated into our implementation. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, so my question for you is, what do you see as the role of development and implementing partners in identifying and reaching those hard to reach populations? And if you have some examples of that work, uh, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Judy. Uh, a lot of what I, I was going to say has already been covered, so I'll probably just summarize that. Uh, but in brief, I just want to say um, development and international partners, they play a very crucial role, uh, particularly in identification, of course, of uh, these unreached populations. Uh, but since the discussion is about these, um, I know we've gone a long way in this discussion already, uh, but I do want to build on the definition of Charles on what these unreached populations are so that we have that in our minds as we continue uh, this discussion. And I'll simply define them as those who have limited access to malaria services and, and limited in the sense that um, these are populations or communities um, who are sort of uh, deprived um, either because of um, uh, barriers uh, related to geography, language, uh, education, um, uh, finan financial support. So anyone who is unable to get all the malaria services they, they deserve uh, because of all these barriers, I uh, will consider them as unrich. But I'll also add a quality uh, dimension as well because uh, those that we provide services which are not of good quality, they are unlikely to get the desired benefit from those interventions. And we can consider them uh, as unreached as well. But back to your question, um, I think this has already come out. Uh, also, you'll find it in the global malaria reports. What can development partners do? We have a huge funding gap. Um, and despite having that gap, I think development partners, implementing partners have a role um, of working to try and mobilize additional resources. Everything that we do is dependent on financial, um, financial support. Mm -hmm. um, the international partners, uh, development partners as well, they also have tools, they have um, approaches um, and lessons learned from different countries which can be applied uh, all, over, mm -hmm. all over the world to try and identify um, these communities, and it's critical that development and international partners provide that support, but not just help in the identification of these unreached communities because there's change over time, but also understand their needs and challenges. And it is through that understanding that we can tailor our interventions uh, and modify our approaches and make them more targeted uh, to ensure that they are accepted because the trust, uh, the buy-in, which uh, James indicated earlier on, is quite critical in the success of our interventions. And, and this has to be done collaboratively with the national governments and, and our communities as well. Uh, but most importantly, I do want to highlight the importance of partners to also collaborate. Um, I mean, we serve the same communities um, and we are targeting the same disease and it's important that we view that at the implementation level, for example, as uh, complementary in what we do as opposed to be sort of uh, competitive in nature. Uh, in brief, I'll say that's uh, some of the roles um, and I'll turn this back to you, Judy. Thank you so much, Mula. Uh, so our last panelist, I'm gonna turn to you and uh, this is Lisa Hare. Lisa, can you just give a brief introduction of yourself? Sure, thanks, Judy. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to join you today. Um, my name is Lisa Hare and I'm the chief of the Malaria Supply Chain Branch at USAID in support of the US President's Malaria Initiative. 
Uh, today's topic is near and dear to PMI's heart. It sort of underlies our new strategy, which is looking at um, how to end malaria faster um, and really uh, doing so by reaching the unreached. So wonderful topic and delighted to join you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, so my question for you is uh, just recognizing that PMI is the second largest provider of malaria funding after the Global Fund. Uh, and PMI's, as you said, PMI's strategy has reaching the unreached as one of its pillars. What are the challenges that PMI frequently encounters in providing malaria services to hard to reach populations? And how does PMI uh, respond to those barriers? Uh, thanks for the question. And, you know, it's very hard to come last in a panel like this, because I think a lot of the themes that have been stated all the way from the beginning with uh, Charles laying out his challenges sort of underlies the challenges that we as a funder, which really uh, we're looking to support the programs um, that are developed at the country level. Um, so the challenges that people have already mentioned are the challenges that we also as a funder see. Um, this includes, you know, how to increase access to quality care, um, ensuring that there are products to prevent, diagnose, and treat malaria, and that they're available when and where they're needed. Um, it is the limited data that we have to guide our programming. And in some cases, some countries have restrictive policies on what um, healthcare and community health workers can and can't do. So a range of the challenges that many have already talked about. Um, under our new strategy, PMI really prioritizes expanding the critical support that's needed for the community health workers um, and working with governments to ensure that these essential health workers are skilled, supplied, supervised, and paid for their work. So PMI provides training, supervision, and equipment to support over 100,000 community health workers across Africa and Southeast Asia to test people uh, with undiagnosed fevers, to treat those with malaria, and to triage those without. And this is a way to really bring uh, care to people. We also invest on the data side. So uh, Dr. Kareen talked about um, surveillance, but there also is a need for healthcare workers to have access to data and to be able to link um, with other healthcare workers within their system. So working with partner countries to equip workers to provide them with access to data to inform their work. This improves evidence-based decision-making by strengthening data collection, management, analysis, and utilization at all levels of the healthcare delivery system. And so we've invested in uh, places such as Rwanda, Senegal, and Burkina Faso to equip community health workers with the tools to better connect with others within the health system and to have the information they need and then that supervisors need and others need to support them. Finally, PMI is also working to strengthen the supply chain at the last mile. So we heard about the access to quality products mm -hmm. to diagnose, um, uh, to treat, um, and to prevent. And so looking at things such as disaggregated data from the community health level, often at, uh, all that information is aggregated at a facility level. So you have little visibility on whether your individual community um, health workers have the supplies that they need when they need them. We're also looking at um, different ways to resupply. Um, and we have a brand new operations research that we're beginning to launch. Um, to have hopefully learn about different mechanisms to resupply community health workers. So those are a few examples of how we're trying to partner with countries to be able to address the challenges that you mentioned. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I just wanted to call out some of the things I was hearing and I welcome people. I think people are putting some questions in the chat. If you could cut and paste them into the Q&A, we can, we can try to figure out um, a couple of questions to take before we move to our next session. Um, I did, you know, I appreciate so much, uh, Charles, you laying out your sort of insights from a community level. I, this is what was so exciting to me to moderate this panel today was having a panel that included not only the community, but also some national level and some implementing partners, and then also these sort of government and um, global uh, funders who 
are trying to set strategy, but trying to listen to, to the community voice. And so we really have this unique opportunity here. And I think from what I saw in the chat, we have some community um, participants who also want their voice heard. So that's really important. And I think sort of the first step is really listening and understanding the challenges are large. Um, we do need to be strategic and thinking what to target. And um, I was hearing things like data. I heard that from a couple of the panelists. Data helps to make really good decisions. The further we can disaggregate data to understand the pockets of challenges, the better job we can potentially do. But also developing trust, understanding, you know, the capacity and, and the passion that exists at the community level to, to make change and bringing that forward to um, be heard by those making strategy and making policy decisions and even funding decisions. Um, a lot of call for funding. We know there's a funding gap. There's always a call for more funding. And so while funding remains not sufficient to address all of the challenges, we have to make really good choices with the funding we have. So let's see if there are a couple of questions we could take. Um, so I'm just looking. Okay, I have one from Anyosh. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing people's names right, so mm -hmm. forgive me if that's not the right uh, pronunciation, but the question is the quality of malaria management, particularly at lower level health facilities, is a barrier to combat the life treating effect of malaria in developing countries. This is attributable to poor testing practice of parasite, attributable to disproportionate allocation of test kits and the interruption in general. How such health supply chain challenges could be solved at last mile supply chains. Uh, this is not directed to a specific panelist, but anyone uh, daring to take that question? I'll jump in since I mentioned supply chain in last mile. Um, <laughs> I won't say I have a universal answer. Um, and it is something I think strengthening supply chain in many of the countries that PMI supports is one of the priorities, but how to extend that beyond the walls of a traditional health facility, I think is still a question that globally we're all working on to try to find a, a correct answer. One is having sufficient supplies, um, but I get back to the data and having that visibility and truly understanding what is what is the needed. How many fevers are your community health workers seeing? Therefore, how many tests are needed to be able to diagnose um, the fevers that are being seen? And so having that data and having that data at a, a disaggregated level so you can actually see what is happening beyond the walls of the health facility really will help inform and, and help guide procurements all the way up to make sure there's enough tests that are coming down and also ensuring that those tests are available where they're needed. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm gonna take one more question. We started a few minutes late and I wanted to give sufficient um, time to our other, uh, our other two sections. And we do have a couple of extra questions here that will continue uh, through our future engagement, but the second question I want to take, uh, I'm going to direct this one to Kareen. Um, the, this is from Edite. It says, not sure what limited data means. Is that about data collection per se or analysis and interpretation of the data already collected and triangulated among different data source, sources and platforms already in use by countries? So uh, first of all, when when we what we mean about uh, issues with data, it's everything. So number one, it's uh, basically the data tools, the data that are being collected. This is uh, one of the issues because we have uh, both issues in terms of quality as well as the data that are needed to guide and uh, policies as well to give evidence for for countries or partners to, to decide on the type of intervention that will uh, have uh, impacts uh, in, uh, in, in, for instance, in re reducing malaria. So this is number one. Number two, there is also the data integration. So we this is maybe in terms of the data system. So uh, it's important to have uh, interoperability as well as integration of data that can speak together instead of uh, vertical data 
that uh, are not uh, uh, senat are not harmonized and uh, being used by every everyone to 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 inform policy. And then the third one is also the use. So we tend to have many uh, data sets, many uh, data that are being uh, collected. But at the end of the day, they are not used to, to inform policy as well as uh, to address uh, all the bottlenecks that we have in Malaya control. So for me, those are the, 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 the key elements of the data issues that I was mentioning. Thank you so much, Karine. Uh, I, I realize there are more questions, and I'm, I'm just going to take us forward to the next session, uh, the next section of our discussion. Um, so we've heard from our panelists about uh, who are the unreached. We had a few different definitions there, um, some of them you know, based on geography, but recognizing that geography is not the only driver of who is unreached. And so um, also recognizing that not every country is the same and who is the unreached. And there, there are many barriers, but there are also, um, there, there's a great need to connect what is known and what is being done at the community level to, uh, to, to have better alignment of those global resources, the funding, the strategies, the training, the supplies that are required in order for the um, interventions that are done at the community level to have the greatest effect. So with that brief summary, we're gonna jump into the next section, which is really a discussion about what we think is working. And so I'm gonna start with Kareen. Kareen, you're, you're on again, um, but the, so the first question is to you. From a global policy perspective, what are the necessary elements to ensure countries create an enabling environment conducive to reaching hard to reach populations? Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you very much for your question. So uh, for me, maybe I will focus on three elements that I, uh, I found are crucial, especially at uh, when I look at the role that we 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 and the mandates that we have at the RBM partnership to end malaria. So first of all, uh, number one, it's um, it's a strategic partnership. So it's really important that uh, strate strategically we move all the Malay the global malaria community, including. Uh, all partners, donors, as well as W2, uh, the Abmian partnership, towards a deliberate uh, discussion on a people-centered approaches for us to deliver all the, the malaria control intervention in terms of care as well as uh, uh, prevention. So, and the second one, it's um, it's important that we also get a greater focus uh, on uh, increased access to quality. Uh, as well as the, the this component of gender and equity. So we tend usually to forget that it's important, especially, and maybe that's why we, we are failing in terms of having uh, pregnant women accessing IPTP. So it's really important that we also consider uh, the gender uh, issue uh, in that. And then uh, the, 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 the other one is the country leadership as well as uh, the country uh, political will. It's really important that uh, we get at country level a greater uh, communi community participation in services in parallel of what uh, we, 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 we do in the improving the primary health care. So for me, those are really uh, the, the, the most important uh, elements. And then, of course, when I, I talk about strategic partnership, it's also getting better engagement of the private sector, multi-sectorial uh, sectors through coordination as well as uh, support uh, based on the country priorities and needs. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great overview. Uh, and I'm going to segue from that question to one directed to Lisa. So Lisa, what progress has been made towards reaching the unreached and what have been the key takeaways since the inception of the, of the current PMI strategy? Uh, thanks, Judy. So just to mention, we're sort of in our first year of implementing the strategy, so we're still learning, although uh, previous learnings inform the development of the strategy. Um, but just to note, I think one of the key lessons and one of the things that really informed our strategy is that we need to take a tailored approach to reach the unreached. Um, so we've already heard um, the different definitions of who the unreached are and how that varies 
perhaps by country or even within a country. So a lot of uh, reference to geographic, you know, so <laughs> access to services five kilometers away, access to quality services. Um, but then the others are looking at that unmet need and pockets of unmet need, and those might actually be evolving. Um, so in some cases, uh, peri-urban settings uh, may have significant unneed, and we are currently seeing a, a new invasive vector um, that is thriving in urban settings, um, which I think could change for those areas where this vector is, um, is, is growing and expanding might be another pocket of the unreached uh, that we traditionally haven't been focused on as a malaria community. So um, understanding that all those definitions then lead to different approaches in the context um, of different countries um, also require different approaches. Um, so I'm just going to give a couple examples across the countries that PMI uh, has been working with and supporting. So in Zimbabwe, we supported the development of community service delivery centers in 40 hard to reach communities in some of the highest malaria burden provinces. So um, this really was sort of on that access side. Um, and um, by doing so, we made insecticide treated nets available through those centers. And it, this led to 137% increase in nets that were distributed. Um, in Nigeria, where often the closest source of medical care for some of the hard to reach communities is a private sector pharmacy. Uh, PMI trained more than a thousand private sector pharmacy assistants in remote communities to be able to test treat, and then also to refer. And finally, um, another big population uh, where we are con continuing to see unmet need is among refugee populations, internally displaced populations, those who are cut off uh, because of conflict. And so uh, one example um, how we have worked uh, to support um, reaching those populations is in Ethiopia. We train community members to conduct indoor residual uh, spraying in refugee um, camps and in districts that um, included IDPs. Um, and we were able to, through that, protect 725,000 people. So again, different approaches um, given who is defined as unmet um, and unreached, and then also the settings in which we're operating. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Those, those examples really bring to life what we talk about when we're trying to really address, address the issue and, and the community affected. Um, James. You're the, the next person I'm going to ask a question to. Um, so the question is, implementing partners are usually restricted in scope to the donor priorities and the, as well as the local policy framework. Uh, what has been Malaria Consortium's experience adapting and expanding implementation to include impactful approaches, which may not have initially been part of the suite of approaches funded by the donor? Thanks for that very important question, Judy. Judy. Our experience is mixed, and what we find the, is that it depends on multiple factors, such as the funder's rules and regulations, the size of the grant, the duration of the program, and the national policy context. In general, what we find is that there is more flexibility if the program includes adaptive management or quality improvement approaches from the outset. I think that that for me is key. And I think um, a couple of people have pointed out things to do with quality of services. And here I'd like to point out quality of the program itself. It is more difficult with highly innovative approaches. For example, engaging with the private sector, especially the informal private sector, where unfortunately and paradoxically, hard to reach communities are likely to access malaria services in some countries. So I think, I think the general rule is the more innovative, the less data or the, um, the further away one gets from the health system, I think the more difficult it is um, for, for some of our programs to then adapt to the context to really address this topic of hard to reach. Thank you. That's an excellent insight. Uh, and 
something we should all be thinking about is, you know, our, our, our infrastructure and resource, resources are not limited to what is formalized. So thank you for that um, example. Mula, can you please describe your experience with commonics and extending the reach of malaria interventions to ensure that all eligible and targeted individuals have access to these services, both at facility and community level? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Judy, for, for that question. So I will say Chemonix has contributed in a variety of ways uh, in ensuring that malaria interventions uh, reach um, all deserving communities. And I will say we have probably contributed in some way to almost all the malaria countries. Um, starting with some of our ongoing work um, right now, uh, which is focused on supply chain, for example. Um, through that project, uh, what we're doing is to ensure commodity security. Um, uh, and, and here I'm talking of malaria commodities from vector control products uh, to commodities used for diagnostics and, and, and the medicines that are used to, to treat patients. And you all agree with me that um, we can find communities that are enriched, but as long as we don't have the commodities uh, to help them uh, protect themselves or be treated against the, the disease, then they'll still be considered unrich. Um, and, and it is through this work that um, we probably cover almost all malaria countries. And I think I saw a question from Joel uh, in Kenya. Uh, I'll confirm that we do have work there in Kenya where through a project called Afia Ugavi, we um, were distributing uh, bed nets um, or supplying bed nets in, in Kenya. Uh, apart from this project, uh, we have been involved in actual service delivery. We have ongoing work in, in the DRC as I speak right now. I know there are teams distributing bed nets uh, door to door. Uh, we have recent work uh, supporting diagnostics, um, uh, malaria case management, malaria impact pregnancy uh, in, in, in Mozambique, where the focus was on strengthening the quality of, um, of services and also the engagement of communities and, and mobilizing them so that we get their buy-in and, and trust in the malaria services that we uh, provide and um, uh, so that they utilize them because that's key uh, for success of the interventions and uh, the outcomes, um, which obviously this project contributed to uh, are also telling. Um, apart from that, um, we have also been involved in, in strengthening the national systems uh, with the projects in West Africa covering uh, several countries where we're strengthening the capacity of the NMCP, and the partners to plan uh, to implement um, uh, their malaria projects. And, and that's critical because that addresses the issue of sustainability. We need to build the capacity of local institutions uh, uh, because during partners, implementing partners uh, will probably not be there forever. So um, as we implement uh, that, that, that is our approach to ensure that we leave that legacy uh, within the communities um, uh, that we serve and the uh, the national governments, so so that they are able to carry on the work that we uh, that we are doing. Uh, I'll pause there and turn this back to you, Judy. Thank you so much, Mula. Uh, I think those are very interesting examples and observations. Um, and it, you know, I think always contextualizing this into a community or a national level is interesting. So I'm going to shift to Balthazar again, to get the national perspective and, and how country programs um, at a national level might adjust. But the question for you, Balthazar, is that Mozambique, as we all know, is susceptible to human caused and natural disasters, including floods, which cut off hard to reach populations from services. A few years ago, security concerns led to internal displacement of populations in the Cabo Delgado province. How has the NNCP responded to ensure that malaria services continue to reach these affected populations? Okay, um, in fact, the situation in Cabo Delgado province is complicated and, uh, and very sad. 
Um, so allow me to pay due respect to everyone who lost their family and friends in this conflict. The government in Mozambique have been working to protect the people for the conflict in general and for malaria in particular, through giving malaria intervention for the people, especially ITNs and case management interventions. Um, due to the conflict, the IDP people are losing their protection and access to health care. To respond to that, the NMCP um, have been working with the community health workers and uh, with the, the military, because as you may know, those are the people who live um, in these very rural and remote areas where the people that we are talking in this um, in this afternoon in, the, in, in this session. So we train them and give them the RDTs and the ACTs um, for, to, to treat the people who are sick. Um, also, we distributed the ITNs uh, in the camps and conduct some focal IRS in some in the eligible place in the camps. Uh, we do also roll out the MDA campaign according to the WHO recommendation for the emergency situation. And we continue to give uh, the SBCC, promote the SBCC activities according to the context in each distance. Um, so to give um, all to give um, all this to the people, allow me to acknowledge the support that we have been received from different, uh, different partners. I'll pause here, thank you. Thank you so much, Balthazar. I think it's a, it's a great example where our best efforts often get interrupted by unintended or unanticipated events, and, and, and it's, it does require collaboration in order to make that pivot. Uh, my last question in this section about what's working is going to be directed to, to Janeth. So again, getting our community perspective uh, on the challenge. So Janeth, as a community health worker and member of a village health team, you're considered the best link to every person within a community because you are part of the community. So how do you think national governments and their partners can support community health workers like yourself in optimizing the reach of malaria interventions? Janet, you're still on mute. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for your question as a VST. So we are even working in the community. So we are the people in the, in the field. So we have a lot of challenges being a VST. But though we have the implementing agency, we are requesting for some support from them if possible, because due to Bio drugs being distributed or delivered to the community. So we are requesting the implementing agency if they can add more drugs or adequate medicine to be given to the community. Mm -hmm. So even constant what constant supply of the medicine should be in time because we have a lot of cases of malaria being tested because we test and treat. Another one, we are making timely reporting. Being timely, we have, we have to make a hard copy and we give to the L assistant. So making timely report, we are requesting the implementing agency to provide for us tools for easy work. Even providing tools like <laughs> like electronic light for working at night, because we also work at night. We, we refer those mothers even to the facility. We escort them, we make a full half, so we have to be given some light to make our work easy. If possible, those implementing agency should also make a training 
for those who are even existing, because other villages, they have few VSTs. If they can train more, so that we have a L talks, we go to schools, we go to churches, but that one all, we can also make a change in, in what? In malaria control and prevention. Also, if possible, the, the implementing agency for make our work easy, they can facilitate us because we are few. Facilitation can also make our work easy because being a VST, you have to be as an exemplary, you have to be a smart because we are sometimes called nurses from the community. So we have to also be as what? exemplary to the community because we treat, we make a full half, even those pregnant mothers, because sometimes they even feel sick with what? With malaria. But due to the program being integrated to ICCM, we don't work on those what pregnant mothers, but we make sure we refer them to the what? To the end facility to get more what? More services. So in addition to that, during sensitization, because the other time they distributed the nets, we went for the mobilization, we went for sensitizing community, how to use the nets, how to tie it, how to keep it properly. When it is done, they have what? They have to mend it. They have to sleep under the treated mosquito net to, to prevent the, what? the spread of the malaria. So what I can say as a VST and other colleagues, because we are having even other challenges in our villages in our to reach, because during rainy season, we don't have gun boots, we don't have umbrellas, no protective gears to protect us so that we move to the, to the far community because we don't serve only one community. We have a lot of communities to be served. Due to few numbers, we are even struggling because we want people to be healthy. In addition to that, due to low level, level of our education, because we are not educated after the higher education, so we need even refresher training. If monthly or during the time we are taking the reports, they have to make what? a refresher training for us so that we also get more knowledge, we get more tools, we get also other, other missing what? Our, our other missing tools. So we are seeing also if we can make a change visit to other what? To other districts so that we learn more from other PSTs who are outside what? Outside our districts. So what I can say as a VSTs as we are working in the community. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So what I heard from this session, this section of the discussion is that there is quite a bit that's working, but despite that there are quite a few um, challenges still and, and perhaps some opportunities that could be better, um, better applied to, to finding better responses. Uh, and, really, you know, listening to what has worked in one place and whether it could be reapplied in another place. Um, I do want to jump in to, to try to address a couple of the questions. I see 15 questions that are open, so we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but I do want to highlight a couple of them. And uh, I think that both Charles and Jan brought forward a point. This is a question coming from John Mwangi. Um, the question is, Charles brought in a very important point where there is still a, a section of the population that is not well educated. Are there any thoughts on getting to the last mile in terms of advocacy and social and behavior change communications, SBCC? Vulnerable populations are still left out in terms of receiving key malaria messages. So I think the question is really, how do we, how do we make sure the messages are well understood and heard? And maybe there are some new tools we could apply to improving that kind of messaging. I, I welcome Charles, your thoughts on that question and any other panelists. 
you have any reaction to that, Charles, what we can do better to help with the messaging? Or Jana? Yes, Judith. Yes. Thank you once again. I'm done responding to these questions. Uh, the action point, we feel if the organizations or the government or implementing agents, they can give the supply constant, it would be very good with all the community commodities that required to maintain our community else uh, with equal ratio. When they give uh, the number of anti-malaria, they give the number, enough number also for RDTs and even uh, HNS uh, form that is reporting tools and all the other thing. That is the action point that I feel I should air it out. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm going to I'm going to jump to one more question before we pivot to the next um, series of the, 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 the next discussion point. Uh, so this question is from Drake Zimmerman, and this is about um, how can we gather the lessons from areas where, where malaria is getting to zero or has gotten there in places like Timor Leste to inform training in areas of higher transmission. So how do we work to collect essential data? Um, and I think maybe either Corrine or James, if you might want to jump in and address this. Corrine, do you want to go first? OK, it's yeah, it's 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 an interesting proposition. And I think in general, um, a key point here is how we sort of share lessons across countries and across regions um, and really to see malaria elimination as a continuum rather than than, than a dichotomy. Um, so I think there's some learning that we all have to to put in and there will be some value. But I think the the the, the context specificity and avoiding the one size fit fits all really means that we really have to listen to what communities are saying and what um, the technical people are saying in the field. For example, Dr. Candrino, his team and others um, in these countries, because they really know what is required. They have some of the answers. And if they don't have the answers, they have some of the processes that can be used to find the answers. And I think if there's one message, it's how do we, you know, think about country ownership, country leadership, and the fact that countries need to be part of the solution, just like communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karine, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, in addition to what uh, James said, uh, we at the RBM Partnership to End Malaria, as I say, we are a platform that convenes and coordinates partners and that includes malaria affected countries. So uh, through the country and regional support uh, mechanism, me, we usually, uh, first of all, um, convene all the national malaria control program with partners and according to region. And what is very, it's even uh, very good that this year, we had a, a meeting with uh, the African countries that were actually with the National Malaria Control Program from B Bangladesh, uh, Timor Leste, and others where we are sharing. So it's more a, a, a forum where uh, National Malaria Control Program, uh, as well as partners, are documenting as well as sharing the best practices. And this is where other countries are learning what to do and how to do since uh, they, they, they have practical uh, evidence. And then uh, in addition, we also give technical support uh, from the RBM partnership. So we usually identify uh, consultants as, as well as experts that are coming from elimination countries to go and support uh, countries where 
who are still at the control phase where they can also learn as well as support so that they can also improve in their malaria uh, elimination. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I, you know, we're at 10:12, uh, and we're supposed to wrap up at 10:30. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into our third section, um, and this is really building on the first two. But the, this, these questions revolve around what are our next steps globally, and nationally and at community level. So, uh, Lisa, the first question comes to you. PMI aspires to reach unreached populations and to sustain this reach over time. What approaches to sustainability are the most promising? Uh, thanks for this very simple and easy question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so from PMI's perspective, sustainability of malaria programs really hinges on investing effectively in local partnerships to lead the fight against malaria and other challenges. So PMI's, as I mentioned before, PMI strategy shifts away from a one size fits all approach to a more tailored approach that meets each country where they are in their journey to end malaria. PMI supports countries on this journey in many ways, but right now I'm just going to focus in one aspect, which is partnerships and partnerships at different levels. So um, PMI builds on successful partnerships to make strategic investments that support local governments, civil society organizations, and local research institutions. So they are better equipped to implement malaria programming. So one example is investing in a local university in Zimbabwe to expand national and district capacity to conduct entomological monitoring to really guide the effective um, vector control interventions. Another example on the other side of Africa in Ghana, um, we provide financial and technical assistance to community health management committees in Ghana to develop and implement malaria action plans. So again, really trying to tailor based on the local context. Um, also looking at partnerships, but at sort of a different level, um, we support countries to mobilize different partnerships and generate domestic resources for malaria. So one example is by supporting the establishment and building the capacity of end malaria councils. So these councils are being created by countries to mobilize additional resources for malaria from the government, from the private sector, and from nonprofit organizations like religious institutions. Another example is working with other um, non-government partnerships. So um, in this case, working with the Rotary Club in Zambia to expand programs to eliminate malaria by supporting the training of health facil facility staff and providing training and supplies to community health workers with the aim of increasing access to malaria diagnosis and treatment for more than 1.3 million people. And what uh, this partnership has done is leverage resources from the Road Reef Foundation, um, from the Gates Foundation, and from World Vision to bring it to a total of six million. So looking at partnerships from the local level all the way up um, to be able to leverage the resources to sustain uh, programming. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, Corinne, I'm gonna shift to you. If you look at current progress towards the 2030 targets under the Global Technical Strategy for Malaria, only the WHO Southeast Asia region seems to be on track. What should be done at the global level to change course and improve reach toward the achievement of those 2030 goals? So, um, first of all, I can say that we are I feel that currently we are in a good position for once again driving the significant progress against malaria in the next uh, 15, 20 years. And this is because uh, countries are continuing to make progress on elimination with, uh, of course, dedicated community health workers uh, as uh, Charles and Lisa, as we see here, we have improved case management, strong surveillance, and more. So we have the ability to 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 do uh, to do better. So for me, what is important is number one, we need to make better use of uh, the tools that we we are having. So it's important that we improve the use as well as the effectiveness of the existing uh, tools as well as malaria 
intervention we we have and then we also need to do better with the current resources as you know there is lack of funding and then of course try to think of innovative financing uh, to double the investment uh, in malaria and then the third one is as i say improve the primary health care so that we can reach the hard to reach population so it's important for us to do a system rethink to strengthen the health system up to the community so that we can reach all the, the people uh, in need. And then uh, the last one, I think it's also important that we invest in accelerating uh, transformative tools uh, that are in the pipeline so that we can, we can improve and uh, uh, bend the curve towards uh, malaria elimination. Of course, what is also uh, important is, as I said earlier, empower leadership for Malay endemic countries, as well as uh, 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 working together so that we can strengthen all the health system and then uh, coordinate uh, partnership uh, at global as well as regional and country level. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I'm hearing a bit of a theme there. There has to be this sort of coordination at many levels and also this uh, looking at what's in the toolbox that we already have and tailoring it to the situation, to, to the on, on the ground reality that you have. And it's not necessarily one size fits all. We have to tailor to the context. Mula, I'm going to shift to you now. Uh, from a technical and implementation perspective, what are the key steps to be taken to increase access to quality malaria services? Yeah, thanks so much uh, for that uh, question, Judy. Um, so what we need to do is one, we, we need to continuously monitor uh, the delivery of um, uh, malaria services, uh, evaluate um, what is being provided to uh, the beneficiaries, to, to the communities and assess the quality of delivery from our healthcare providers. Um, and this includes those at the facility level and um, at the community level in areas where we've cascaded our interventions to uh, to that level. Um, we we also have to continue to strengthen uh, the capacity of the healthcare system, and that includes um, the, the the management level, but also the uh, service delivery level. I mean, uh, new approaches come on board, the way we deliver services changes over time. And we have to keep track of that and continuously um, make sure that the latest approaches, which ensure delivery of quality services, um, cascade to all those who need to know and who deliver uh, those services. But most importantly, we need to continuously gather local data and look at it at that level uh, to determine the outcomes. Are we succeeding in reducing morbidity? Are we succeeding in reducing um, our mortality? And work with the communities uh, where we deliver services, get feedback also from them in terms of um, what they perceive uh, as the quality of services and, and work with them to uh, figure out ways of ensuring that um, they receive the services in a manner that um, uh, uh, that is sort of applicable and appropriate to them, but also not moving away from what is uh, required through science. Oh, Thanks. I'll, I'll send this back to you, Julie. Thank you, Mula. Uh, I am going to shift now. We've been hearing from, from some of our global partners and implementers, but I want to hear now from Baltazar at the national level. So from the 2022 World Malaria Report, the WHO Africa region is off track for the 2030 targets for both incidence and mortality. What actions do you think host governments and national malaria control programs should take to alter the current trajectory? Um, well, um, to, to alter the current trajectory, the government um, should invest on data quality to inform the police to make well accurated plan for interventions. So it's really uh, important to have the map for the country in terms of where the high risk population lives. 
After that, we should ensure the universal coverage for core interventions. I am talking at least one better control intervention, case management, and uh, surveillance. So um, now it's coming, the chemo prevention is coming out. Um, so we need to think about that intervention. Um, so we can't miss the pregnant woman and the children under five years as well, because as you may know, is a, is a, is a vulnerable population for malaria. Um, so we must work hard to make sure that these interventions go to reach the last mile and no one can, no one is left behind. Um, the message for better use for the intervention is crucial and uh, must be maintained. To the hand, the NMCP must implement all these interventions with high quality to achieve the great results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Balthazar. So shifting from national to community level now, um, Jenna, this question is for you. We know there are still gaps in ITN, bed net coverage, and connecting services to those in need in many of the communities where we are addressing malaria. Can you tell us about some of the successes you've had in engaging your community to access and utilize malaria services when they need them? Thank you so much, panelists. We have gaps in, in getting in touch to those households who are in need for malarial services. I categorize that one into three because we treat and test. Due to that one, we have in, in adequate what? Test kits, those malaria drugs to be given to the community. So if possible, we have to implement onto that one. So there is gap also in reaching those households because we have limited what number of VSTs to reach all those households. Because for VSTs, C, C or she, E or she should have to serve what? 25 households, but you find I as Janet, I have to serve over 200 households in the community. So that would make our work to be what? To be difficult. So this is in our movement. That one can also make our work to become what? To become hype. So if they can create more VSTs, you train them so that they come into the system to make our what? Our work to be easy so that we can reach every, every household. In addition to that one, is also important. We also do what on visit. On visit, we do it for, for knowing those children who are born, who are also what the services for us, like the what, like the, mm -hmm. the, the, the treatment we have given to them. So we have to follow all those people being discharged from the facility, even those pregnant mothers whom they have been what who have been on medication for malaria. So we have more VSTs to be trained. So that one I can say, if they do it, it will make our work also to become possible and we shall be proud of our work. So thank you so much. I don't have much to say. Thank you so much, Janeth. It's, it's a wonderful point. And I think there's great pride in the work that, that everyone is doing here and, and, and just not enough. Um, not enough to support everything that, that needs to be done. Um, in the interest of time, I'm only going to bring forward one question from our audience um, on this topic. And the question is uh, from Samba Kamara. The question is, how can the private sector be used to reach the unreached in our communities? And if there are any lessons from any of the panelists, that would be great. Um, I think I'm gonna ask, maybe Mula to address this first and anyone else who might want to jump in. Yeah, yeah thanks so much, uh, Judy. I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, we are aware that the, in some countries, the private sector does contribute significantly and we don't know about that. And going back to my initial discussion, 
Um, for the same reason, we need to map our unreached communities. We also need to be able to map all the stakeholders who are contributing to, to our malaria services and reaching uh, communities that we may not be aware of. Uh, in some instances, we may consider them an unreached because if the private sector is not involved in um, the latest, uh, in implementing the latest um, uh, approaches for malaria uh, or are not aware of um, the, the latest developments, then they are unlikely to deliver uh, these interventions appropriately. So that's a dynamic that we have to be aware of. So it's very important for our national programs uh, to continuously be on vigilant and be in a position to map out uh, all these decals that, that, that are involved and then integrate them into all the efforts from the planning uh, to the rollout of, uh, of interventions. Um, and, and it's only that way that we can access data also from them, which we can use to monitor also how they are contributing to the response, um, including reaching these unreached communities. Thanks. Thank you, Mula. Uh, you know, we're coming to the end of our session. We have about two minutes left. Um, just, just to recap briefly, we've heard different perspectives on what defines the unreached, um, what's working, what are some of the lessons learned. We recognize that data is critical to help drive good decision making, um, both in how programs are executed and how funding is, is allocated. Um, we need real community engagement in order to be successful. And um, we need the ability to adapt as new, new technologies come forward, new lessons are learned. And as the situations around us um, evolve, including things like conflict, or as we've learned over the past three years, the pandemic, there, it's, it's easy to be disrupted in our execution. Um, we also heard that we have a lot of passion and uh, the panelists coming from global to very community-based bring that passion forward. So I'm gonna ask one final question to panelists and I'm gonna ask you to answer in five words or less, um, what, is one action or one principle you think we need in order to guide us? And uh, I'm gonna start with, um, with Janice. What, what do you think we need to keep in mind as we move forward in just a few words? So thank you so much. I have one action point, if possible. We have to improve on the what? Preventive measures is the cheapest, like, when the nets is being distributed to the community, we as a VST, we can go and sensitize them, we educate them how to use the net, how to keep it, how to manage the net so that the, the malaria can be what? Can be eliminated in our community. So this is one actual point I have to put across. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm actually, I, I was remiss also in asking James a question in the last part. So I'm gonna shift to James quickly and ask you both to answer this question and to give me your principle of moving forward. Um, what is the most important lesson you learned when trying to extend the reach of door-to-door -door interventions like SMC? And then give us your principle for moving forward, please. Thanks, thanks, Judy. I, I think a couple of, of lessons. Door-to-door -door approaches can achieve equity and they require context-specific information to adapt them to various settings. I think that's important. Using existing health structures is essential to achieving effective coordination, supervision, and that strong community engagement builds community trust and ownership. For example, working through community leaders, religious leaders, and cultural leaders. I think a key point for me is that quality improvement should be embedded into approaches that reach, whether it's, we call them hard to reach or you know other parameters. And I think that for me is one of the guiding principles is that just reflect, if we had quality improvement approaches embedded over the last five years or 10 years, imagine where we would be um, in terms of malaria control and in terms of this specific topic. So my principle, I think, is 
develop solutions with communities instead of solutions for communities. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, James. Um, I'm going to ask Baltasar to speak next on uh, a key principle or action that should guide us. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I will be very, very brief. Um, the key message for me is uh, um, the key intervention and the message um, based on the scientific evidence and information and the tools available. Um, so the malaria intervention must be implemented and it is made, disseminated without delay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Balthazar. I'm going to shift next to um, to ask Charles to give us a key principle from his perspective, what we need to keep in mind. I think mentorship is also is there. Mentorship is also key. Uh, involving all political leaders and religious leaders and all the opinion leaders is also key in prevention. Uh, I think those are because the others, my colleague has already mentioned. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, we're, we're really over time. So I'm going to ask uh, Kareen, then Mula, then Lisa to give us your, your um, guiding principle. So first, Kareen. Yeah, so uh, as we discussed today, uh, uh, for, for us, it's important that uh, improve access to malaria, you know, diagnostic care, preventive intervention uh, are essential to achieving malaria elimination. And one of the key principles is equity, equity mm -hmm. in access to services. Uh, in hard to reach population is critical for malaria and sustaining malaria uh, elimination efforts. So one of the most important for us would be to, 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 to strategically moving all the global malaria community uh, towards a deliberate discussion on people-centered approaches uh, to deliver to delivery of care and preventive uh, measure for malaria. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Crane. Mula. Thanks, Judy. Uh, for me, the principal message is uh, products and commodities. Those are standard, but the approach is those should be flexible. Um, and the easiest way to innovate is to continuously modify your approaches and, and, and working with the communities to sort of tailor approaches uh, to, to their needs that will take us a long way in terms of uh, moving the malaria response to the next level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mula. And Lisa, you're our final uh, panelist. Give us your thoughts. Yeah, um, so very much uh, building on what Mula just said, uh, mine was going to be really the need to tailor approaches um, and to do so by listening, um, listening to the community, have their voices really guide how and what um, uh, is needed. Uh, the approaches that are most appropriate for that context um, and having their voices be the lead um, as we work to invest to end malaria faster. Thanks. Thank you so much for our wonderful panelists and thank you to our participants for staying over five minutes. We have at least 20 questions we weren't able to answer. So there's obviously a desire to continue the dialogue and we welcome you to engage. We'll try to address some of those questions in the coming weeks, but thank you once again for such a lively discussion and presentation and thoughtful uh, input from all of our panelists. So wishing you all well in the rest of your day and uh, hope to continue the conversation. You all can also continue the conversation online if you'd like. I put the hashtag mm -hmm. in the chat and um, we'd love to hear more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all. Bye bye.